So now, let us talk about this uh, floating capacitor. There is a capacitor CF that floats between the input and output. Now, how do we compute pole that is created due to this CF? Yeah, so basically, we, we have to apply something known as Miller's theorem in order to break this capacitor into two components and then try to evaluate the pole, basically at this particular node as well as at this particular node. Clear? So what do I mean by this Miller's theorem is, is I have a node 1 and 2. Between the node 1 and 2, I have some sort of impedance which is represented by ZF. Now this ZF could be split into two components. One is Z1, the other one is Z2. Okay, And also make sure that uh, the voltage that I have across node 1 with respect to the ground is marked as V1 and the voltage that is marked between the node 2 and the ground is labeled as V2 here. Now, how do I define this Z1 and Z2 expression? Should I do it or shall I directly give the expression? Okay, so basically by making use of the KCL, okay, so I have to look for the KCL at node 1. Okay, so I need to equate the KCL that I'm getting here should be exactly the same KCL that I need to get it here. Okay, so what I do is for this current flow direction, I have something like V1 minus V2 divided by ZF supposed to be equal to the current that is flowing from here. Okay, uh, sorry, the current that is flowing out of this device. Okay, so here the assumption is I'm making use of this current direction, okay, to be leaving out of this node, okay. So how do I uh, write the current expression that is flowing in this particular path across Z1? Or what is the current that flows across Z1? I have V as well as Z, so V divided by Z1 should get me that, right? So it is V1 divided by Z1. So now. After doing all this manipulation by uh, plugging all your expressions, you would end up having an expression for Z1 that is equal to uh, ZF times that of V1 divided by V1 minus V2. Okay, so again, I'm going to uh, rearrange this expression such that the Z1 would become something like ZF divided by V2 by V1. Okay, is that is clear? So now, in general. If there is a gain from node 1 to node 2, let us assume that the gain is set to be a, a v, okay. Now how I can rewrite this expression further? The assumption is between the node 1 to node 2 there is a gain and I am stating that the gain has a value of a v. Now how do I rewrite this expression in terms of a v? Okay, z of divided by 1 minus a v. Okay, so we will put a modulus. Uh, uh, sorry, we will not put a modulus. Sorry, we will not put a modulus. It's just the gain. Okay, yeah. Now we have used the KCL at node one in order to evaluate the expression or, or the value of Z one that I need to plug in in order to replace this Z of right. Now, what is the expression that I need to have for uh, Z two with the assumption of having the same current direction? Okay, so I just write this KCL at node 2 to be equal to the same current direction, but so the current that is flowing through ZF could be modeled with the same thing like V1 minus V2 divided by ZF. I am assuming that the, at node 1, the currents are leaving out, okay, and at node 2, the current has to come together and that's the reason, okay. Yeah, so how do I express this current flow that is flowing across this Z2? The current is flowing from a lower potential to a very high potential, right? Yeah. So that would be equal to minus V2 by Z2. And now when you just rewrite this expression, uh, you would end up having something like ZF divided by 1 minus V1 by V2. Okay. Now again, how will I redefine this V1 by V2 term? Because I said AV is a gain expression that is from V2 by V1, but what I have here is the inverse of it, okay. So due to which I need to write it as 1 upon 1 by AV. Is that as clear? Yeah. So this is the Miller's theorem and uh, let us try to use it across a simple uh, circuit something like this. I have two resistances and basically I have a resistor R1 
that connects between the node x and y. Okay, and now when I apply this uh, Miller's theorem, I replace this R1 with R1 plus R2. Okay, and there is something that happens here. Okay, there is one more resistance that's been added, whose value is, seems to be a negative value. Is it physical? Can we have a resistance with a negative value? Until this is an active device, I cannot do that, right? So it's a passive element. Now, what is flaw in this particular uh, method? Okay, the conclusion here is I cannot apply a Miller's theorem to a path where there is only one particular path between the node x and y. Okay, so we, what I really mean to say here is okay. Obviously, this rises to a question, right? Then where can I apply this Miller's theorem? Yeah, somewhere, if at all, if you have some kind of circuit, okay, where the main signal path is defined between this node and this node, and along with this, there is a parallel path, and there is some kind of impedance that goes in parallel to both the nodes, okay, x and y. So if you have such situation where you have a parallel path, something like this, then for such kind of paths, you can apply this Miller's theorem, okay. So now what we do is uh, we'll try to uh, have it here. Okay, this is what I am saying here. I have a parallel path. Now I want you to apply Miller's theorem in order to evaluate the value of Z1 and Z2. What is the expression for Z1? Okay, ZF divided by one minus gain, or in other words, it is the opposite node divided by the input node. Okay, so it's always like that. From whichever node I'm looking in, I first need to select the opposite node divided by the incoming node or the node at which I'm observing. Okay, so one minus v y by v x. Okay, yeah. So now, what is the value of this z f? So z f is again one by s times that of c f, correct? And I'm just going to plug in the same thing. What is this v y by v x term? From this structure, I know that the gain between this Vy to Vx is, happens to be minus A. And now, when I plug in this value across it, I have this minus A. Okay. So now, I rewrite this and I have an expression which is 1 upon. Yeah. So now, this Z1 represents what type of element? Is Z1 is representing a residue element or a capacitive element or an inductive element? How do I identify by looking at the expression on onto my right? It's a capacitance. We know that anything that has an expression of one by s times some magnitude, it represents a capacitance. Okay. So let me uh, have this as my C1 or C in, which is equal to this. So what is the value of the C in then? Yeah. So C in is nothing but cancelling out all the common terms, we would end up having C f into 1 plus the gain. Okay? Is that as clear? So this is my C in value or the capacitance that I am looking from node x. So what would be the value that I would have when I am looking at node y? What is the capacitance value that I would have when I am looking from the other end of my circuit? What is its value? So again, uh, you have to bring up the same formula, right? So, what is the expression for this Z2? Okay, ZF minus the opposite node, which is nothing but Vy, divided by the, the node at which you are observing, which is Vy. And we know that this expression is the inverse of the expression that I have. So, So when I look across the uh, right hand side of my Z2 expression, you could see what type of component is that represents actually? What type of element, resistive, inductive or capacitive? What is this A? Does A has a unit? It's a voltage by voltage, so there is no unit. So some quantity has been multiplied, so it's a number, okay? So basically one upon S times some capacitance with some value would be again a capacitance itself, right? So there is nothing to uh, think so much. So what I have here is the output capacitor that I have C out could be expressed as C of times that of 1 plus 1 upon A. And now if the value of A is quite larger, 
then this 1 upon a could be a negligible quantity and we can approximate this value c out to be approximately closer to, to a value of c of itself. Clear? And this is the c out expression. Okay, so again, uh, we'll look back into poles and nodes. Uh, I have stated that the poles that I have across the circuit are non-interactive. Okay, so I will let you know what is meant by non-interactive and interactive uh, poles. But as of now, I just want you to compute the poles and the corresponding transfer function between the V out and V in. Okay, I want to evaluate this expression. So first of all, I need to identify the poles. Okay, so how many poles do we have in the circuit? Three, because there are three capacitors, and each of these capacitors have a corresponding finite amount of resistance. Right, so. Let me label uh, the pole that is created due to the node M, let me label it as omega M and this one as omega N and omega P. Okay? So what are these pole frequencies? Uh, how, how do I define those uh, pole locations? As I said before, it is always 1 by RC. What is the value of R and what is the value of uh, C I have across this node M? Okay. Rs. Okay, so if I look up, I have Rs, and I am going to assume that the input impedance of my A1 is going to be infinity. Okay, if that is the case, I have this Rs in parallel with infinity, so effectively you will get only Rs. But probably if you are getting a doubt, you might be having a doubt with respect to Vn. What do I do with this Vn? Why, why am I not considering the impact of Vn? Whenever we find any impedance, what we do as a first step? Kill the source. Okay, So we generally kill those input sources. So that's the reason why we always neglect this particular thing when I try to evaluate the output impedance or any kind of impedance that I'm looking at it. Okay, So there, there is no impact from my VN and it's basically the, this end of the resistor is connected to the ground. Okay, yeah. So now uh, it is Rs times that of, what is the resistance that I have at the bottom plate of my CN? Zero, right? So I have this Rs plus 0, that is the effective uh, resistance that I have across the capacitor times that of the capacitance value which is Cn. So effectively what I have is 1 by Rs times that of Cn. Okay? Now how do I define this omega n? I think by now we have to tell. Uh, why do you have to think so much? Uh, whatever is represented here is nothing but the output impedance of my A1 stage. Okay? So, don't think what is the imprint that is having at this end. It is all being uh, returned as a Thevenin's equivalent value across R1. Okay, so that is the assumption that we are making. What would be the pole that is created due to this R1 and uh, Cn? Yeah, it would be one by R1 times that of Cn. Okay, and similarly, omega p would be R2 Cp. Okay, so we have found all those uh, poles. How do I write them in terms of V out by V in? First of all, what is the DC gain that I would get right from this point to this point? Yeah, A1? Yeah, it's just the multiple of A1 into A2 and that is the gain that I would transfer. Okay. Now, the reason here is there is no drop across this resistance. Why is it so? Under DC condition, these capacitors possess an infinite impedance and as I said before, even the input capacitance or the input resistance of my A1 is also infinity. So no current would flow through this path and there is no drop across my resistance. Okay? It's just A1 times that of A2 would be my DC gain. Okay? Now how will I add the poles? The pole will come at the denominator or the, at the numerator? Denominator. Yeah. You tell me how do I add those poles? For, yes. So this is something like this, right? For a circuit like this, I have a single pole and how did I represent and what is my 1 in this case? 1 is nothing but the DC gain from my input to output and that has been divided by the pole which is 1 plus S by omega, correct? The same way. So it is 1 plus S by omega m. So this is the total uh, transfer function that I have and their corresponding poles and their corresponding DC gain at the numerator. Clear? Now, this is known as an interactive pole. How many poles do I have in the circuit? I am not going to evaluate it 
uh, that, will, that I will not do it, but I just want to address only this question. How many pores do we have? There are three capacitors. Yeah, so splitting, splitting will uh, add pores? No. Yeah, so here is a case where I have two paths, okay? The first path, okay, and the main signal path is here, okay? So okay, in order to evaluate the uh, pole due to the R3 and C3, we have to apply Miller's theorem. When we apply this Miller's theorem, we would have something like ZF, and this ZF could be split into two components as Z1 and Z2. Now again, since the passive elements are, can be merged in the way that I evaluate, you will find that the total pole created at node X is the combination of not just R3 and uh, C3, but I also have to include the impact from C1 and R1 as well, okay? So it will create only one single pole at node X, and at node Y, it will again create one more single pole, okay? It will not create four poles, okay? Even though we split it, we, we combine them with the corresponding nodes, resistance, and capacitance, and the combination has to be evaluated as a pole factor, clear? So the answer is, it has only two poles, okay? I'm happy that you didn't say three, because uh, whenever there are, there are three capacitors, people tend to say that there are three poles, but, okay. So now, I just want to calculate the pole associated with node X. So at node X, I need to evaluate uh, both R and C components, right? Can we apply Miller's theorem for this? Of course, right? Because I have two paths. This is my main signal path, and this is an accelerated path where we have some kind of uh, impedance, okay? So how will I replace this CF with a kind of capacitor at the input or at node X? What is the value of it? Yes? Yeah. So it is nothing but CF into 1 plus the gain, okay? So there is a magnification at the input when I look across this capacitor CF, okay? Now I have the C, I have the resistance. What is the pole? 1 by RS into CF into 1 plus A, okay? So this is my total capacitance that I have. Now. There is one question that I just want to ask. At the very beginning of the class, I said, even though the value of CGS is greater than the value of CGD, we didn't neglect this CGD value. Why is that? Can you reason it right now? I'll just show you the circuit again. Yeah. So in the place of CF, I have a capacitor between the gate and the drain, and I mimic this CF to be equal to CGD. Now, what happens to this CGD when I look at the input side? Yeah, when I apply Miller's theorem, because this, the main signal path is here, okay? So, this path has some gain. We'll talk about it in the next class, but uh, this just because of this reason, the CGD, even though it seems to be small, at the input, it seems to be a very large value, whose value is magnified by this quantity. And that's the reason why we are not neglecting the CGD value when we try to evaluate the transit frequency. Is that as clear? Yeah. So this is my pole, and let us look for the second one. How many poles do we have? And assume that the value of lambda equal to zero, and I just just quickly ramp up the uh, expression for the poles, okay? Um, how many poles do we have? Is the poles or is the capacitors or interactive or non-interactive? It's a non-interactive? Yeah because I, I, I don't have any component that is attached between the X and Y. So, how many poles do I have then? Two, okay? One is at node Y, the other one is at node X, okay? So, I, I guess you might be uh, knowing the answer. Can you tell me the, the pole at Y? Okay, one upon? RD, okay, uh, there is an assumption uh, that I, put it up, it is RD into CD. Okay, yeah, exactly. It is 1 by GM. That is the total impedance, uh, uh, total resistive component that I see from the top plate of the CS. 
And the bottom plate of the CS doesn't say any resistance, so it is actually zero. Okay, so effectively I have this as my residue component multiplied with my CS. Okay, that's it.